Thank you, Dave. That was beautiful. Well, welcome. The Lord be with you. Well, as many of you know, I'm Pastor Linda Beatty. I still have a script. It just, it's strange. Sorry, Dex and Liz, but I want to. No, I want to welcome you to, um, to Longview Presbyterian Church. I, as I told you last week, I love you guys. I am so proud of what you're doing in the community and how you live out your faith beyond these walls. I would like to welcome any and all who are guests with us today, and I brought my own from New York. Shannon, yes, my best friend from a long time ago when I was back in Boston, um, she acquiesced to come to a Presbyterian church because she's Catholic. So we welcome her. And as our wonderful acolyte has shown us, today the Christ light indeed lights the world, and it is among us in the family of faith, warming us and filling us with the power of the Holy Spirit. We are a community of faith, seeking Christ's way and welcoming all people. And I am so incredibly thankful that you decided to grace us with your presence in this lovely heat. There was another word you might have thought. I know. <laughs> well, we plan to have a fellowship Zoom gathering up there this week for you to stay connected to our LPC family and accessible by the same Zoom link that you've been using for all LPC events. They ask us to join them this Tuesday at 7 p.m. for a time of check-in, fellowship, laughter, and community prayer. At this time, I now invite Kate to lead us in the call to worship. Join me in the call to worship. God of the past who whispered in the prophet's ears, who rescued us from sin's oppression, we are here to thank you. God of the future who is tearing down the old world and building your kingdom in our midst. We are here because we trust you. God of the present who in the giftedness of our diversity creates us to be one people. God of life that surprises us when we find it within us. I now invite you to stand as you're able to sing along with our opening print, M, 682. It is good to sing your praises.
You may be seated for the kids' time. That always gets me. I have to get ready. So I have a question, and I expect all you kids to answer. Right? Okay. Um, how many of you have had successes in your life? Okay. Did anybody say, ah, good, congratulations, excited for you, but good luck? Sort of maybe. Okay. How many of you have had what I might call failures in your life? Oh, just a few people. Okay. When that happened, did anybody come up to you and say, oh, that's too bad? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, we tend to do that. So this morning, I want to focus on an old African tale that sort of talks about that, and it will be a segue into the bigger sermon, if you will. There's an ancient African story that goes something like this. A farmer's horse disappears, and all the good neighbors come up to him and say, oh, such bad luck. And the farmer says, perhaps. The horse comes back with two mares, and the neighbors all say, such good luck. And the farmer says, perhaps. The farmer's son tries to ride one of the new mares. He falls and he breaks his leg. And the neighbors say, such bad luck. And the farmer says, good job. You guys are right on cue. But the next day, the local chief decides he needs to gather together all the able-bodied men to take a vengeance or whatever at a neighboring place. And the son can't go because of his broken leg. And the neighbors say, such good luck. And the farmer's response was, perhaps. Well, the import of this story is to remind us a quiet mind that goes beyond the judgment and the quiet then quits labeling everything in our life as either good, bad, or neutral. We should just see life's events as life events, just as they are, and deciding how we are going to respond to them. I'm going to do a, um, this isn't written down here, but because sometimes when we win something, we forget about the guys who lost. And sometimes when we fail at something, we forget to get about the good things that we're good at. But how we handle the successes and the neutralities of our life, as well as the failures, says a lot about us and our faith. So our response should be not what we label it. That's not our focus because it will not be all vanity, as you will hopefully see in a few moments, vanity as empty breath and empty life. And now I have to find out from my script where we're at. Oh, this is exciting, it's the confession. When we could be revived by God's grace, we find ourselves fearing God's judgment doubting God's joy in us, fearing God has turned away from us. So let us come to the one who heals us, the one who calls each of us by name. Our confession begins by inviting any who wish to speak aloud together the reality that we worship on land white settlers once stole from our indigenous siblings. In the world to come, Injustices are made right, and the earth becomes once again a beloved relative cared for by all people, especially the original indigenous stewards of that land. As we speak this land acknowledgement, let us follow it with actions that hasten the coming of the kingdom of justice. It is vital to honor those who came before us 
and acknowledge the long history of what is now Southwest Washington State. This area has been home to ancestors of the Cowlitz Indian tribe for thousands of years. The land, with its rich resources, enabled the Cowlitz people to flourish, and they stewarded the land with their traditional culture. Today, we must appreciate the persistence of the Cowlitz people and the important role they play in our region as together we steward the land for all our descendants. We continue in prayerful confession, and anyone who wishes is welcome to pray along with me with your words in bold. Let us pray. You hold nothing back from us, amazing God, yet we are determined to cling to what we have accumulated. We spend so much time dining out, we cannot feel the deep ache our hunger for you causes. You invite us to set aside our old ways and walk with you, but unknown paths fill us with fear. Have mercy on us, bread of heaven. We come to you, our God of grace and hope, not for our personal satisfaction, but for the joy of recognizing the one who calls us to new life and for the grace to share that joy with everyone we meet. This we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God loves us. God forgives us. God lifts us to new life. Thanks be to God. Amen. It's time to pass the peace of Christ to one another. Feel free to do it as you will, whether it's the hard peace. Peace of the Lord be with you. Peace of Christ be with you all. Peace of Christ. Peace, George. Peace. That's right. We can do that too. Peace of Christ with you. I like it. I, that's all right. Life is good. Oh, well, at this time, I invite Kate to come back and to lead us in the prayer for illumination for the first reading of Scripture. And please pay attention carefully to this first reading of Scripture. I thought you had it printed in your bulletin, and you don't. So, not that I ask you to memorize it, but I do ask you to listen. Thank you. Uh, I can Holy God, allow us your wisdom by the power of your Holy Spirit. Open the scriptures to us today that in the word read and proclaimed, we might know your truth. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Ecclesiastes. It comes from chapter 1, verse 2, and 12 through 14, and chapter 2, verses 18 through 26. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. I, the teacher, when king over Israel in Jerusalem, applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun, and see, all is vanity and a chasing after wind. I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to those who come after me. And who knows whether they will be wise or foolish? Yet they will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This is also vanity. So I turned and gave my heart up to despair concerning all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes one who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by another who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. 
What do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun? For all their days are full of pain, and their work is a vexation. Even at night their minds do not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him who can eat and who can have enjoyment. For to the one who pleases him, God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he gives the work of gathering and heaping, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a chasing after the wind. This is the word of the Lord. The gospel for this day is from the 12th chapter of Luke, beginning at the 13th verse. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to them, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, hmm, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, ah, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you, and the things you've prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The word of the Lord. Well, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord. Amen. I wore the wrong glasses. Well, it's not too great a surprise that I'm going to talk about vanity. Or something about that. I love words. I absolutely adore words. I paint pictures with words. I've written books with words. I, I love finding words I don't know what they mean. And, and so I took this word vanity because it's a word I don't use very much. And I looked up the etymology, which means the history of the word, right? And how it came to be and how it's taken on this meaning of ostentatiousness and puffed up pride. Vanity is an old word. However, it's not the word that was used in Ecclesiastes in 150 BC in Hebrew. See, you're surprised. I learned stuff this week, yeah. Kohelet, can you repeat that for me? Kohelet, perfect, is the Latin word for, I'm not, it's a Hebrew word, sorry, for teacher or preacher. And if you pick up a Hebrew scripture, instead of reading Ecclesiastes, which is the Latin word, you will read Kohelet. Surprise. Yeah, you're gonna learn stuff today. I'm so excited. Ecclesiastes, is speaking to an assembly. He, um, it has to be a he, he's a preacher. And I would really encourage you, because you don't have it in front of you, is to read the whole book, because it's one long sermon, and you're gonna be so glad I'm not preaching that whole thing, because we'd be here until the heat of the sun is sitting, sitting out there. So I'm glad we don't do that anymore. But, this Hebrew word, which I could not find how to pronounce it, um, literally means empty breath. And when they took their time to translate the Hebrew Bible into Latin, they used the word vanus to take that word, to take the Hebrew word, and that's what it meant. And it meant at that time, empty, void. 
But it wasn't until the 1300s when the French decided to expand that meaning of vanity to be worthless, void, invalid, feeble, conceited. And my most recent reference that I could think about when I was thinking about where do I hear the word vain is from, I think it's Carly Simon's song, You're So Vain, which is not a very nice song. No, not very complimentary. And prior to that, it was my grandmother's admonition, don't you take the Lord's name in vain. Okay. But that seems to be a bit of a stretch from what that original word vanity meant to the writer of Kohelet. But before going back to what vanity might mean to us as we read that text, I opted to check out one more resource, the dictionary. I know, it's surprising. Vain is an adjective. For some reason in my head I thought it should be a noun, but it's not, it's an adjective. And true enough, in this century, the primary definition for vanity is filled with or showing undue admiration for oneself, one's appearance, pride, and conceited. Yeah, the second theory is to be unproductive, worthless, fruitless, useless, a vain attempt at doing something, which I'm hoping the sermon is not. But. Okay, thirdly, having a vain hope is having no real basis of worth, frivolous, empty, unreal. It's like planting a squash seed and hoping to get a tomato. I mean, that's a vain hope. And lastly, Funk and Magnus determined that vain can also mean, I love this word, ostentatious and showy. But we need to step back in history to look at this word in the context of the time it was written and the time it was preached. The author of Ecclesiastes saw a certain futility in life and the temptations to just kind of give up on life. When he wrote this book of wisdom, which I think is kind of interesting, we talk about this book as one of the two books of wisdom, three books of wisdom, he lived in a very changeless world. Not much was happening. Status quo for generation to generation, hundreds of years. The environment, their culture, everyday lifestyles remain the same. So nothing people could do or did do, he reasoned, would change the world for the better. So why would this preacher write such a depressing essay on life? Well, I think it was to challenge the hearer to looking deeper for a spiritual request. I've had some friends in my life who are either really competitive. If I say I have one child, they've got two. If I say I've got a cold, I've got the flu. I mean, it's like a competition. You gotta be one up and one down, you know? So maybe he's just kind of bringing everybody to a place where they, wait a minute, it's not that bad. That's what I'm thinking and that's what I'm hoping. People will never be able ever to completely master the world. Anybody disagree? Thank you so much. Will we be able to explain all the mysteries of life? No. Nope. Will we be able to justify our own existence? Nah. So 21 here, years later, we're still struggling with the same things Kohelet was. People do have a choice to become very selfish and cynical in their life, or they can reach out to God. When someone turns to God, they do not turn their back on the world. They just look at the world with new eyes and a trust in that greater power who actually is the master of the world, who can explain the mysteries of life and who can justify one's existence upon this earth. Through God's eyes, believers hold, life does have meaning and purpose. Most of us in our daily humdrum sort of lives as we plod along, we, we look for markers to kind of brighten our day and make us feel better, to break the monotony and to bring us some happiness in those long days of drudgery. We look for vacations. Does anybody not look forward to getting off of work and going on vacation? No hands. Or holidays. 
or special gatherings with family and friends like having Shannon come visit me was a highlight for me this week, despite the heat that she brought. <laughs> Yet even those days, they come and they go. And the happiness that they bring is gone like a breath. Or maybe they fail to bring us that joy that we expected. But it's precisely this sense of drudgery and even meaninglessness of life that the writer of this passage for us today so aptly describes, even though it was a bit here, a bit here, and a bit here as it was read. Kohelet is learned in wisdom. We grant him that. And he says that himself in verse 13 that Kate read. He says he knows wisdom. And he speaks with authority to those who are assembled to hear him. When he has found is that that wisdom, however, it's full of human folly and reasoning, thinking that we know it all and how we're we supposed to respond to it. And as you've already told me, we don't. To understand all that is done under heaven, it was read in verse 13, is so far beyond human ability that it's foolishness, he says, to believe we could even make a dent in the vastness of what we don't know. And here in 2022, it seems like the more we think we know, the more we know that we don't. Yes. It's like continually peeling back for the scientists, the cell and the atom and the mitochondria and, da -da -da -da, and even, the, even the DNA we're still peeling back and trying to understand. We don't know it all. One of the reasons that I travel with Road Scholar is that I don't know what I don't know until I learn it. So my travels are always an adventure. Kohelet writes in verse chapter 12, verse 12, that's why I encourage you to kind of read the whole thing. Of making many books, there is no end. For an infinity of books could never contain all knowledge. And yet we still write, we still seek, and we still read. The search for wisdom will never be finished. It is like chasing after the wind. But that hasn't stopped us for centuries. We still seek. And moreover, Kohelet has observed that what often passes for wisdom in his day is worse than folly. It's simply untrue. And I think we can affirm that with the recent hearings and the political climate of our age. It remains a truism that not all things we think are true are. Like Job's interlocutors, popular wisdom in Kohelet's day was that the good prospered and the evil suffered. But Kohelet's study of wisdom and of life has revealed to him the folly of that reasoning. The good and the evil ultimately have the same end, death. Nobody gets away from it. And even more unacceptable in his observation at that time, he says, there are righteous people who are treated according to the conduct of the wicked. And there are wicked people who are treated according to the conduct of the righteous. Chapter 8, verse 14. And I was reminded of that this week when I had an opportunity to see a 1923 newspaper account where a black landowner, honorable businessman, was shot in the back by a white police officer who was known to be quick with his gun to blacks. The article said the police officer was acquitted after 10 minutes, despite the public outcry. That was 1923, and it seems that history keeps repeating itself. The good and the evil do not get what we think they deserve. Sometimes it's the opposite of truth. And this, to Kohelet, is vanity. It's a fleeting nothing. It's meaninglessness. 
empty wind. He painstakingly delineates the various areas of a person's life, if you read the whole thing. He talks about work, labor, toil, success, justice, and oppression. They all comprise vanity, an empty breath. So for Kohelet, all the things in which we, even now, 2022, tend to put our effort in, in our life and value, all those things upon which we focus our attention is pure vanity. They're either gone on the breath with nothing to show for them, or they're downright evil, he says. There is a meaninglessness that prevails over all human activity, like doing the dishes. So what does Kohelet prescribe, right? He's a preacher. He's got to give you some good news. So he says, eat, drink, and be merry. And it's a popular text that even was summarized in our, our gospel lesson as well. Do we gather what enjoyment we can from our life? Because there's no more meaning to that than just momentary pleasure? Oh, I don't think so. Such a prescription itself seems like a waste of life. Something I fear for the persons I talked about last week when I, who were atheistic, oh my goodness, to just simply seek one's pleasure and expect nothing more is to give up in despair and to accept that meaninglessness and that hopelessness as a given, to preclude even the possibility of something more substantial. But it also, shows a very strong lack of faith in God who delights in our being and in whom we too can find delight. Such an interpretation is far from the word that Kohelet had before us this morning. The, care, the cure for despair and hopelessness and the desire of God for human beings is to find joy in the most weariness of our life. And he says this several times. There is joy in the humdrum. He says it in chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 5. Kohelet asserts that when we're confronted with apparent meaninglessness in life, the best we can do is to enjoy ourselves in it, to take joy in whatever eating and drinking and whatever work that we might have. A particular joy, he says, is to be found in the companionship of one another. Two are better than one, he writes, for if they fall, they will lift one another up. How cool is that? That's in chapter four. We are to see enjoyment in play, in work, and in relationships as gifts from God. And indeed, enjoyment, he says in chapter two that Kate read, enjoyment comes from on high. It comes from God. Truly, taking those snippet of verses out of context this morning does leave one wanting. For those words in total are not depressing or just empty breath. In the midst of a life that seems riff with monotony and dissatisfaction and even sorrow, out of the corners of our eyes, we can see small glimmers of God's grace, goodness, and mercy. Yeah, we've got days like Christmas and Easter and those moments when God's dazzling light suddenly breaks through with an aha. But that only happens a few times a year when it's a really big, oh, wow. The rest of the time, we can only catch a glimpse of that glitter here and there as we struggle through the demands, through the tedium, to what Kohelet calls the meaninglessness of life. Despair casts a veil over our eyes, blinding us to the brilliance of God and his love for each and every one of us. But if we see those momentary joys just for what they are, as small pinpricks of light in that veil, then we live not in despair, not in meaninglessness, but we live in hope for the day when that light just shines brilliantly over all. I can't tell you the joy I had when I picked my raspberry, a raspberry that started from a seed 18 months ago in the back of my refrigerator. 
I had to share the other one with the bird, but that's another sermon. <laughs> so my friends, despite this despicable, that's a good word, heat, let us enjoy the remaining days of summer before they slip away from us. Let's look forward to that next glimmer of grace where we may expect it, or maybe not expect it, and it'll take us by surprise. I have a Cinderella squash growing in my beets. It was a surprise. You should ask Shannon what I did. Yeah, be glad for just that brief moment when you can feel God's grace, love, and mercy. It might be for a second, but oh, it's so worth it. And when that moment is over, remember how to respond. Let's look forward to that next, I'll bite, hopefully experience your response. Just might say, hmm, perhaps. Amen. At this time, you may, I believe, stand as you are able, and we will sing hymn number 698, Oh, Take Me As I Am. I don't know if uh, any of you found our opening hymn this morning unfamiliar, um, but in my 60 plus years in Presbyterian churches, I think it's the first time I've sung it. So it's all right if you found it unfamiliar. Um, wow, you guys did pretty good. Our, our next hymn um, is new to me as well. Um, You're not so, Lutheran, so it may be new yeah. to you. It is in the same style as um, the songs that we sing as part of our service of healing and wholeness that are repeated um, short uh, stanzas. So we're going to sing it through three times. So by the third time through, it will be familiar to you uh, next time. Take or oh, take me as I am. prayer concerns? Are there any from our Zoom folks? Thank you, Julie. Okay. Well, we continue our service in prayer, sharing our joys, our concerns for the communal prayer. Um, you can send your prayer through chats, as I just requested, um, through the prayer sheet. Is there any others that need to be done? If not, you can speak them as you will from the sanctuary. And at the end of each prayer, we say, God in your grace, and your response will be, receive our prayers. Okay. Let us pray. In our 50th year, we pray for our church's vacation Bible schools of the past. The children and the youth who have been benefited from these educational and connective experience have met you there. We pray that we as a church continue to engage our children and our youth in sharing your love. God, in your grace. Receive our prayers, O oh God. 
We lift up our prayer for Jeannie Olander, who has been diagnosed with congestive heart failure. We seek healing in whatever form you grant to her and acceptance of that which will be. God, in your grace. We praise for joy in the celebration of 49 years of marriage this week for Jan Gillespie. Is that true? Well, you guys don't even look over 50. I'm impressed. Yes. So congratulations. We just uplift your marriage, what well, has been, and certainly we ask for continued blessings for that which will be. God, in your grace. Are there prayers from the people? Um, yeah, I would like to thank all those who have signed up for Meals for Family Promise this week. We still may have one uh, need to be delivered on Saturday if anyone's interested, but I think all the other slots are taken. And also prayers for Daryl and Gail Berg. Daryl's the one that usually schedules these. Uh, even while they were over in Hawaii, they were working on it, but he developed COVID. And after a couple of days, they had to get out of the hotel. And when I called him about the list of people that signed up, they were waiting in their car at 11 o'clock because they had to get out of the other hotel and they couldn't check into the next one until four uh, for his full recovery. Uh, they were supposed to be home and then go somewhere else uh, for a family thing, but they're still in Hawaii right now. So prayers that he can get over that. And both he and Gail are kind of depressed right now about it, but oh, yeah. they're dealing with it. So yeah. prayers for all who have COVID and all who are stranded. That's right. And for the families yeah. that await them. God, in your grace. Hallelujah. God, in your grace. Here, we have our prayers. Thank you. Well, I would love prayers for my daughter, Hannah. She and her husband Connor as they move into their new home, and she's expecting and just blessings upon their new home. God, in your grace, we have our prayers. I have another um, note regarding our 50 years. As a couple people asked this morning, and as we um, observe and luxuriate in the warmth of, of the day. A week from tomorrow um, is the scheduled installation of a heat pump for this space uh, with prayers that we will find ways, we have some hope that we can be a cooling center in the future when, when we nice. have that ability, um, that we can put the generosity and the grace of the 50 years of people who have supported this building and continue to put um, their stock in it, that we will find ways to make it part of making this community safer um, and more inviting. Beautiful prayer, Ron. As I said, this church is so tied to, concerned with, and compassionate about our community. So may that heat pump be a blessing to all. God, in your grace. Yes, Robert. So apparently our guest musician, Dave Wilson, is being shy today. Yes. And so I'm going to make the announcement for you. Thank you. He is putting out an album of his own music that I don't know how quickly it will be available, Dave, but anyway, you might want to speak with him and see what that might be like. Um, he's a delightful musician. I've known him for a long time. and. He's played for me, and he's played for himself, and he's just a great musician. We were glad to have him as a guest musician, but now you could remember him with an album. And they are all his mama's favorites. Yes. It is called Mama's Favorites. Yes. yes. So a welcome success to Mama's Favorites and a gratefulness for the blessings that David has given us, not only Yes, well, yesterday, last week, this week, and all the days to come. You are blessed with a marvelous talent. I thank God for you and for your wonderful fingers. I wish you good success, and I ask God to hear us in his grace. Amen. 
Anyone else? So take us, oh, take us as we are. Summon out what we shall be. Set your seal upon our hearts. O oh Lord, live within us. God, in your grace, we pray together to our parenting God, just as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have been given much. Not so we can hoard them or take pride in what we have, but that we might be able to share our goods with a generous spirit. With joy, let us bring our gifts of tithing to our God. Today we will continue with our passing of the plate as an option for you during the church service to give financially to sustain this ministry. But it's not a requirement on anyone, and we recognize that each one of you gives in more ways than just monetarily, and we celebrate those actions as well as a gift to God. You can, of course, continue to give via mail or online on our website if that works better for you. This is a time of significantly increased financial stress for many, and if you are in need of any financial assistance during this difficult season, please do not hesitate to contact the deacon assigned to your parish group. You can also contact the deacons via email and the new deacon's email address, longviewdeacons at gmail.com or the new deacon phone line at 360-747-7136 to begin the process. We would love to support you in this tangible way. We invite you now to consider all the gifts you have given this week as we enjoy an offertory from our guest musician, Dave. Thank you.
The doxologies on um, number 607. from you, O oh God. Take our offerings and increase our generosity that everything we say and do might show forth your irrepressible love. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. I invite you to continue to stand in body or spirit for our sending hymn number 318, In Christ There Is No East or West. today at Longview Presbyterian Church. And for those in person, we will not have fellowship inside. So please keep your masks on and maintain social distancing until you're outside the building. For those of you joining us on Zoom, you're invited to stay online after the post for some fellowship and chit chat. Oh, I love the benediction, I tell you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you a sense of wholeness and peace and a knowing that life is not meaningless this day, any day, always. In the name of our Father, Parent, Son, and Holy Spirit, the people said, Amen. You may be seated for our postlude.
Thank you.